Welcome to Write With Love. I'm your host, Sarah Williams, best-selling author, speaker, and creative entrepreneur. Each week, I chat to passionate and inspiring authors about their journey in creative writing. Some are traditionally published, some do it themselves. Everyone's journey is different, and everyone has something interesting to say. We all love love and love what we do. Today's show is brought to you by our amazing fans and supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to help support the show and get some awesome bonus episodes, go to patreon.com forward slash Sarah Williams author to learn more. Now here's today's show. G'day and welcome to Write With Love. Today on the show, I have the pleasure of chatting to Sarah Mabry. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for asking me along. Oh, it's a pleasure. So can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your writing journey so far? Uh, so I'm a romance novelist and script writer. I'm based in Melbourne um, and I've written probably more than 40 books now. I haven't counted for a while and I've written more than 100 hours of television and yeah, I pretty much write full time, which is an amazing gift from the universe. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And did you always want to be a writer or how did yes. that all come about? Yes, I used to borrow paper from kindergarten and fold it in half and staple it and make little books, etc. And uh, when I was in high school, I did my sort of rip-off version of the Sweet Valley High romances with all of my friends in various roles and I would write fictional versions of them with the guys they had crushes on, which, you know, was a way to popularity, right? <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so not even, like, really just a straight rip-off when I think about it in hindsight, but fan fiction, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, fan fiction, that's what exactly. <laughs> and what about that? Did you go into it as a career or...? What did life no, take? No, I, I, I did a um, degree mm. in professional writing and literature mm. and I, I I think pretty much once I graduated, I tried to, um, I submitted manuscripts to Harlequin, Mills and Boone mm. and I just kept on getting, you know, rejection, rejection, rejection. And then I got one um, and I just went, that's it, this isn't going to happen, um, put that away and I sort of disappeared into the world of trade journalism um, for six or seven years where I basically ran a magazine called The Australian Hardware Journal, <laughs> which is exactly as exciting as it sounds. Um, Pitch me, the only woman in a room full of men talking about power tools, just awesome. And then I went and worked for Mitre 10, um, the big hardware chain. I started up a consumer magazine for them and... Then I got a job at Neighbours as a storyliner and it wasn't until I started working there that I, and we plotted a few long burn romances, that I started to realise that my last book that I'd submitted to Mills and Boone Harlequin, that my characters had been psychic. They knew <laughs> what the other person was thinking all the time and there was no risk in anything they were doing. There's no unknown. And that was when I came up with my own little personal sort of epiphany I guess about romance that romance is about risk it's about not knowing what the other person thinks and whether they reciprocate and that you've got to you're going to put yourself out there and be vulnerable and is, is it going to work out or not and um so I and then kind of at the same time I was cleaning out my desk and I found a letter that last rejection letter and it was you know with two or three years air on it really encouraging <laughs> I was like, oh why did I why did I stop doing this? Like, this is really nice. Um, and it said they wanted to hear from me and they really liked my voice and please send them something more. And, you know, told me what was wrong with that manuscript, which was, oh, yes. And I didn't even bother trying to revise that one. Mm. I, um, I just started a new one from scratch. And it was a little bit based on the experiences of being in the story room which is, you know, a really intense experience. As a storyliner on Neighbours, there's usually three or four of us around the table with the story editor and we're all throwing ideas on the table and getting excited about what happens next and, oh, my God, and then this happens and then she says that and he says that and you act things out and you cry and you share things from your childhood and teenhood. And um, sometimes new people come into that mix and your sort of instinctive reaction is, hmm, well, not 
100% certain about this person yet. But then in that pressure cooker environment where everybody's making themselves vulnerable and being really honest, it's hard not to just fall in love with everybody, really. Their humanity comes out. Yeah. And so I, um, I created two rivals at work and he thinks that she's really um, stitched up and irons her underwear and she thinks that he's just, you know, this sort of ne'er-do-well, sort of modern rake, I guess, and uh, they get stuck in a lift together for several hours and get forced to know each other better. And that was the beginning of Can't Get Enough, my uh, debut with Blades. Um, so I sent that off and I waited uh, almost a year to hear back from the publisher. And it does often take time with Harlequin Mills and Boom because um, they take unagented submissions. Mm. So I was kind of, I'd have waited not that long before, but I had waited months. And eventually I just was like, screw this. I'm going to call up and find out what's happened. Because, like, I can call them. This is a business discussion. And so I rang up and I got put through to the woman who had become my editor, Wanda Ottawell. And she said, well, I actually emailed you several months ago um, because I really liked your story and I wanted to talk with you about some revisions. And I'm like, I did not get that email. So I spoke to my brother who was looking after all of our IT things at that point in time and he downloaded a patch for our server and all of a sudden all these emails that have been sitting out floating around in the universe just downloaded into my computer and amongst them was basically this revision request from Mills and Boone going, hey, we really like this. Do you think you could tweak these things? Blah, blah, blah. And... Yeah, that was that was kind of the story of me almost missing out on being published yeah. because of a technical glitch. Oh my god, that's where just being proactive and picking up that phone, yeah. like, oh my god, <laughs> imagine if you'd have missed that where you'd be now. <laughs> I know. I really, I really don't know. Actually, I suppose I'd still be working in TV more than what I'm doing. Although I, yeah. I don't know that I would probably be able to stop myself from writing books because there's um, TV so collaborative, mm. but books. You're like your own little dictator, and I, I do like being a control freak in that way. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Now, I should just mention for anyone, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure like everyone in the world would have heard of Neighbours by now, this very long running um, soapy. 30 years, baby. 30, 30 years. years. Oh my gosh. And, you know, I'm from New Zealand, and I remember we even had it. <laughs> and when I first met my husband, he was addicted every, you know, five nights a week, it was on TV. Um, so yeah, very long running. Australia is very well known for neighbours, the, um, you know, the neighbourhood neighbours show as opposed to Home and Away, which is the beachside show. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's incredible. So do you get to meet those, the cast and, and crew and stuff? How does that kind of work? I'm, I'm like in love with the movie TV idea and I just think it's so glamorous. So <laughs> it so isn't, <laughs> especially the writer's room, which is, you know, usually, a a sealed box because we're noisy and raucous yeah. and, um, you know, by the mid-afternoon everybody's sick of each other and all that sort of stuff. But, um, yeah, look, we do, now, particularly now, in the time that I've worked for Neighbours, the um, the writing room has been separate from the actual production, which is out at Nunawadding Studios mm -hmm. um, in the suburbs of Melbourne, close to where the locations for the, the court where the... Um, exteriors of the house are and um, in the time that I've been working for the show it's moved to a few different locations and then now we're all out at the studio together and that's really good um, we have lunch in the cafeteria with the cast and the crew um, they see us we see them you know you have conversations um, and that's that's really good so yes but having said that, if I ran into one of them in the street or at the supermarket, they probably wouldn't know who I was yeah. as well, even yeah. though I've been writing for the show for 20 years. Wow. Um, just because that's the kind of, you know, they're the face, we're the little monkeys behind the scenes. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, do you ever get any drama where they come up and like be like, can you change this? <laughs> I want to do this in the next scene. Or... Yeah, look, they, they have a – it's it's collaborative. Yeah. So – I think they very much are the keepers of their characters mm. as well. So 
there are times when maybe we want to push a character in a certain direction or a story in a certain direction and they feel like that's something their character would never do. Yeah. And, um, and sometimes they're absolutely right. And, um, and other, other times we, we work out a way that makes them feel like they're honouring the character more, all that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, we're all in it together. Yeah. That's the thing with making, well, we actually do six episodes a week now because um, we have an extended uh, transmission time. It's on almost all the time now. Mm. And in order to create that within the budget, we actually plot six episodes, even though they only show five, and it just allows them to, you know, produce more content. So it's, it's really, really busy, high-pressured, not a lot of room for mistakes. Um, yeah. yeah. So we all have to be on the same side, on the same page. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. And so what you were saying just before about the characters and would they, wouldn't they do these sorts of things. So that must have really helped you as an author really look at your characters and, and think a little bit deeper than, than some of us might when we're writing. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I think I tend to write quite real characters, even if they're in some um, slightly unrealistic situations. Um, and I, I re I've t realised over time I'm quite an empathetic person. Uh, it doesn't take much to make me cry mm. and, and it doesn't take much to get me really emotionally invested in something as well. So certainly um, when we're plotting around the story table at Neighbours, I'm, it's, I often think that writing is like a form of acting, that you've got to put yourself in the character's shoes and imagine what would I do next? How would I feel? What would I say, you know, in the perfect world if I had the witty comeback at the ready or whatever? Um, and you can see it. I know writers talk about uh, gurning, facial gurning. <laughs> like if you're in a, I don't know if you've ever realized, noticed this about yourself, but when you're, particularly if you're writing an exchange that's dialogue, you know, banter or something mm -hmm. like you sort of, <laughs> you know, you do this as you're being each character and um, because you do get emotionally invested and immersed. That's the immersive aspect of writing, I think. It's, it's almost um, you go to another place yeah. yeah, without yeah. getting spiritual about it because I don't believe in the muse and all that sort of stuff. I believe yeah. in sitting down and putting your bum on the seat and your fingers on the keyboard and working. But Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's it. So um, you do have a few different lines um, we're going to talk about. So you've got, um, so we'll start with these Harlequin uh, books. So they used to have these lines called Super Romance and Blaze. So uh, you've got some of each. Um, tell us a little bit about the difference. Um, so Blaze was my first published line. Mm. Um, so that first book can't get enough. And the, the funny thing about writing that was that I think in the original version they almost kissed before the lift doors doors opened and then, you know, went on to subsequently get it on as they became better friends. And um, because the line of books that I was aiming at when I first sent my manuscript in folded in that year that I was waiting, it was called Love and Laughter, it was sort of like a romantic comedy, my editor said to me, there's Temptation or there's Blaze. So I chose Blaze because um, it seemed to have the bigger distribution at that point in time and I thought that was just the smart thing to do. Mm. And obviously had a much more heightened physical uh, intimacy content. So I started, you know, upping the ante with everything and my editor was like, going, yeah, maybe they should like really get into it in the lift. And so I wrote a version like that and sent it in and she's like, mm, maybe, you know, can we go a little bit further than a kiss? And, and then in the end she just said to me, I think they should do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, well, you should have just said that at the start. I was like, I should totally do that. So I was like, I don't know whether she thought I was a little bit more delicate than I am, I, but, yeah, no shame. And um, so I did all that. So definitely the blazers are um, they're more towards erotica, mm -hmm. I guess, but there's still a very strong emotional romance in there. And um, and then the super romance is is a little bit leaning more towards women's fiction. Um, you know, in Blaze, you're probably not going to be wanting to have spend a lot of time with grandparents mm. and um, dogs and small children and all that sort of stuff. In Super Romance, all of those things, it's home and hearth type thing. And the heat content can vary. So, again, my, my Super Romance is um, the bedroom door is always open in my, my books. Um, so that's kind of the primary difference. And they're a bit they're longer. They're sort of a meatier read and I really enjoyed having that extra page count to play with 
Um, although I did keep on plotting in subplots for those books because I thought I would need it to get up to the extra word count and um, and then pulling them out because I just had more than enough with my main romance as well. So that was kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got Montana Born books with Tule. Um, so cowboys, I love my cowboys. Tell us about those. <laughs> <laughs> well, so... Montana Born Books is set in this fictional town that all the authors have created between us. Mm -hmm. um, it was initially created by Jane Porter and Megan Crane and um, Kelly Hunter. I'm trying to remember the other people who were the originating, uh, original writers mm -hmm. virtually. And then all of us have basically located our books in, and the community has grown. So we have a, a common description of the places in the town and we all have shared characters. Like we, we know that the lady who runs the Main Street Diner is called Flo and we know the sheriff's name and his story and all that sort of stuff. And it's really, actually really, really nice having uh, that shared uh, community to build on. Not unlike writing for neighbours, actually, when I think about it yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's been really good. And so I've written um, uh, for a few different linked series for them. Um, I've done a... a a bridal one. I've done a bachelor auction. Um, I've just done um, this one down here, yeah. <laughs> which is the cowboy meets his match. Yes, yeah. and um, that's set around a rodeo, um, the annual rodeo coming to town. And so yeah, cowboys, romance, small town America. Yeah, and what length are those books usually? That one is. Just over 80,000. 80, so it's a so, decent size. Mm. Yep. Fantastic. And then you've also self published um, some, am I getting this right? Brazilian Australian tattoo artists? Yeah. <laughs> so I have uh, the first book in that is called Satisfaction, and the second book is called Anticipation. Um, and I'm working on the third book on that series too, but I've been kind of a little bit stuck on it and I'm not sure why. So it's been a while since I've had an, an outing with what I call my Brother's Ink series. That's the name of the tattoo parlour that they own and they're twins. Yeah. Um, and they were incredibly good fun to write, really sexy books and, um, yeah, really, really enjoyed doing those. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Cool. And um, so I heard uh, through the grapevine that you also write some romantic comedies with your husband. Tell us about that. Well, so my husband is also a writer and a screenwriter. He's had a long career working in um, executive producing and developing content for uh, both TV and Z over in New Zealand, but also for the ABC here in Australia. Okay. Um, so we um, got together this year or um, late last year and wrote a romantic comedy together. And at the moment we've got that with a few producers just waiting to see what they think and whether we can start getting the ball rolling with that. And we're also talking with another local uh, producer of independent films, etc., about doing some low budget romances that maybe would be set here in Australia. So oh. that's really exciting. That would be really good fun if that, that happens. Cause it's always um, the great thing about working with television on, particularly on a long running series is that you get to see your ideas translated into vision and, the actors interpreting your words, all that sort of stuff. Um, and it would be amazing to have that in a film sort of format. Yeah. That would be really exciting. Yeah, oh, fingers crossed. I just think that would be amazing for you, but also just amazing for Australia to have some more, you know, romances, even if they're low budget. Like, romance doesn't have to be big budgets. <laughs> I, it's so much about, obviously, the core concept, but just great casting exactly. and we do have some amazing actors in this country and mm. if you could get the chemistry right between them um uh, you know a romance usually typically if it's about you know like you think about when harry met sally or mm. something like that there's no stunts there's no car chases there's no cgi or anything like that it's yeah yeah no, two that, people talking yeah <laughs> i just think that would be fantastic that would oh my god i would I would totally support you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, your latest book was The Cowboy Meets His Match, which you were showing us. So tell us a little bit more about this if people want to read it. So it's 
set when the radio comes to town Ooh. to Marietta, our fictional town. And it's the book that I wrote when Harvey Weinstein accusations were everywhere and then we were just hearing all those terrible, terrible stories mm. on social media from all the women who'd been um, sexually assaulted, not just his victims, but the ones that all, everybody, all the Me Too movement, essentially, of women coming forward and going, this is not good enough. Why do we have to live our lives with this shit, essentially? Yeah. Yeah. And um, there's there are moments in romance that in the heat of reading the book and everything, uh, you know, are sexy, you know, the man pushing the woman against the wall and telling her she wants it and all that sort of stuff. I did not feel like I could write that kind of tension and conflict um, and sexy fun with that hanging over me. I just I just didn't feel romantic, I guess, yeah. <laughs> in that way. So I, um, I started researching and I found that there is only one woman in the world who she's a Canadian um, saddle bronc rider who has a professional ticket to compete against the men in, in, in the saddle bronc competition, okay. which is basically a wild horse with a saddle on it mm. and you've, you've got to hold on to um, the rein with one hand and you're not allowed to touch anything with your free hand. Um, and, you know, you can imagine you need a lot of upper body strength, etc. and just bloody guts, you yeah. know, unbelievable, dangerous sport. Um, so I found this chick called uh, Kayla Muscle, and I thought she was amazing, and I thought, okay, well, that's my heroine. Yeah. Um, so I created a heroine who's um, basically at her first pro rodeo after qualifying at various amateur rodeos to get her pro ticket. And there are some men there who don't like the idea of her being in their competition. It's um, they don't think it's for women, mm -hmm. and there are other things that the women can be in, you know. And they think it's kind of a bit of a PR grab from the organisers, etc. Yeah. And yeah. one of them in particular is really angry when she does well. He sort of feels like if she hadn't been there to get that horse in the draw, then maybe he would have got it and he would have had a great ride. Mm. So they vandalise her hotel room and the hero ends up stepping in and offering her a place to stay because his family lives in town and he's got history with his family that he hasn't really resolved. He doesn't spend a lot of time at home. Um, but falling for her and staying at home brings all this stuff up and the family has to sort their their mess out a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah, and it was, I really, I loved writing a heroine who was really strong and she's physically imposing, like she's a strong woman and um, she doesn't take, she's really dignified as well, the way she just handles herself. She's She sticks up for herself but she doesn't, um, you know, she doesn't try to get in the guy's faces or anything. She's just like, you know what, you're not going to steal my dream. I'm just going to keep my nose to the grindstone, grindstone here and I'm going to, I'm going to keep on this path because this is what I want and you're not going to stop me. And uh, and that was awesome writing that as well. It was really... <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. Love empowering women. <laughs> right the world you want to see, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Oh, that's fantastic. So that one's out um, and we can get it everywhere. That's why. Yeah, it should yep. be available. Um, you can get it on on print if you order it from Amazon in particular where they did their print on demand service. Yeah. Um, but obviously it's available everywhere as an ebook. Yeah. Um, and I'm halfway through the sequel, which is called the rebel and the cowboy at the moment. Um, hopefully that will be out sort of in the early sort of half, maybe March, April ish. Yeah. Um, and so sequel is it kind of same people or related yeah. people? Yeah. So it's um, the family is the Carmody family, yeah. his family, and the setup for that is that um, it's Party of Five, essentially. I don't know if you remember that TV yeah. show, but I always loved it. Yeah. Um, and their parents died in a car accident and the older brother has had to kind of give up his dreams to come home and be a parent to them, mm -hmm. uh, the younger kids, and also run the family ranch. So they've got some sort of issues stemming from undealt with grief and also just the way that kind of messes with your relationships when you're both a parent and a sibling and mm. and and not being ready to handle pressures of being a parent as well you know all that sort of stuff so yeah, yeah. oh fantastic so that's what you're working on now so hopefully be out in in april we were thinking hoping <laughs> <laughs> 
good girl and get the word out happening. Yeah, find time away from neighbours. <laughs> <laughs> so where can we find you online and follow you so we know when this one definitely is up? Um, so obviously I'm on Facebook. Just if you have, you know, put my name in there and search, you'll find me pretty easily. Yeah. I'm on Twitter um, and I have a website, www.sarahmaybury.com. I have a newsletter. If you sign up to my newsletter, I promise you I will not bombard you with stuff. I only ever send out something when I have a book or a really special promotion or offer or something like that. Um, I can't be bothered opening half the stuff in my inbox. I'm certainly not going to torture people with a weekly or even a monthly newsletter when I don't have a book to offer you because I figure that's all you're interested in from me. Yeah, that's <laughs> and, <it>. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's probably the best way, to be honest, is just to stay in contact with me via my, my newsletter. But yeah. um, otherwise, I'm always making noise on social media if I've got a book out. Yeah. And, of course, we can follow authors on Amazon and BookBub and that sort of thing yeah. these days yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Got to love those. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for um, for chatting to me today. I really appreciate it and I've learned a lot. <laughs> well, thank you so much for asking, for being interested. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the show. Jump onto my website, sarahwilliamsauthor.com and join my mailing list to receive a free preview of my books and lots of other inspiration. If you like the show and want it to continue, you can become a sponsor for just a couple of dollars a month go to patreon.com forward slash Sarah Williams author and remember to follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and leave a review of the podcast. I'll be back next week with another loved up episode. Bye.